So good luck. Thank you. Morning, everybody. We'll uh, we'll wait a few uh, more minutes here as people uh, come into the uh, to the webinar. So just hang on tight. For those uh, that are calling in, we're, uh, we're just waiting for the room to fill up here. Probably do another uh, minute or two, and then uh, we'll get going.
All right, well, uh, we're gonna get started here. Thank you so much, uh, everybody, for joining us uh, um, this morning for our uh, webinar on Paycheck Protection Program. Steve Japping with the Lansing Regional Chamber. I run our public affairs uh, department. And we're very excited to have Sarah Jennings here from, from Manor uh, to, to walk us through there. There's obviously a lot of questions. Um, there's a lot of questions with everything going on right now. And uh, we're working uh, the best with, uh, with our members and um, on, on uh, working towards uh, providing uh, the resources and information for you uh, uh, to get some of the answers that, um, that you have uh, to your questions. Um, but before we start, just kind of housekeeping, uh, just as a reminder, everybody is on mute. This is a webinar. Uh, we'll have this, uh, this broadcast uh, on, on to our, uh, our website. We'll be sending this out electronically as well. If you have a question, uh, please ask that during uh, during the time. Either Sarah Sarah will try to get to those. I'll, I'll be helping and assisting her um, to make sure we can answer all your questions. But there is going to be time at the end of uh, uh, the end of the session here to answer any of those questions uh, that you may have that weren't answered uh, during the webinar. So, uh, with that being said, I just again I want to thank Sarah for for her time this morning and uh, leave it uh, leave it to Sarah to take it uh, um, start off. Thank you so much, Steve. Um, one of the things that we have definitely been seeing um, throughout our clients is a, a absolute um, bandwidth itch, issue with some um, internet connections and things like that. So please, if you have any trouble with audio or anything else, I don't have my video on this morning because I found that at least for my home network, if I'm sharing a screen and trying to do video at the same time, it stresses it a bit too much. So um, we will be hopeful that I have disconnected enough things and everything goes smoothly this morning. And thank you to the Lansing Regional Chamber for having me today. We have um, really, really been trying to be proactive in reaching out all, all of the team members at Maynard Custiers and um, in reaching out to our clients. We know there's a ton of questions and as I go through some of this information, I do want to reiterate that, you know, the CARES Act in particular, which is what the Paycheck Protection Program falls under, um, last a week ago, um, or two weeks ago, rather, two weeks ago tomorrow, and there have been at least every other day, clarifications and updates and new guidance and things coming out. So um, I, I just want to say it is a very fluid situation. We'll talk about some of those things as we go through. Let's see. If here we go. So first, just to give an idea, big picture about the Paycheck Protection Program. So it is really big picture, again, loan workforce employed. So the goal of this is to help people bridge that gap so you're not having to lay off employees so that you're not having to reduce your workforce, but you can keep them employed and you don't have to go find new um, team members once things settle down a bit, right? Um, we'll go over some of the more detail, uh, details about eligibility, what questions to ask in your workforce. Um, but really big or fewer you must be in business as of February for um, food and um, some some of the the um, restaurant things. And I do apologize if my let's see I'm breaking up just a bit. So I have disconnected again everything. I hope that um, it smooths out. I will go on. So one of the things that we developed is a organizations companies understand program had to be in business as of February 15th. I want to say there, this is a hundred percent, but there have more than 500 employees is the next question. If you were in business on February 15th, 
Yes, you do. So then you'll move down the decision tree. Do you have multiple locations? And then it kind of goes through. If you do have multiple locations, then as I said, there are some additional um, opportunities if you're in food and beverage or part of the NA. Yes, code 72, that's, um, um, the, that's where food and beverage is. If you're not, if you don't have more locations, you aren't generally eligible for Paycheck Protect Program. I would say that there has been in the last couple of days some additional guidance um, related to the SBA um, size and what constitutes a small business from the SBA. So there might still be some wiggle room in there depending on the industry to make. Um, and then again, if you go to the other side, so if we if you are a nonprofit organization, as long as you are a 501c3, you're not doing any of those legislative, there are a few other um, things in there, but you would, um, you would be eligible if, if you're a charitable organization religious organizations as well. There is some, and there is clarity on the SBA website. We're happy to talk about that as well. As Steve said in the beginning, if you have questions, we can put them in both be monitoring those, but we will certainly have time at the end to look at those as well. All right, so um, the first thing you have to do, and I'm sure everybody, since the program actually opened up last Friday when you could start applying th through things, there's been um, differences in when the lending, the financial institutions could actually accept the applications, but it started last Friday. So the calculation includes, in general, the year before this was enacted, so April of 19 through March of 2020, compensation to employees, and payments to independent contractors. Now, as I said, guidance has been continuing to evolve. So when this first was enacted in the application for a, a company, since that, it has actually anticipated the independent contractors will be able to climb on their own starting tomorrow. And I just checked the um, SBA site and um, connected with some of the other gurus at my office. Um, some of the other gurus at my office to see if there was something that they had heard related to that. And we haven't heard any update. Still, um, it is still ready to go tomorrow. The calculation does not include employees so that um, that applies to independent contractors as well compensation for non-us residents is not included already gotten relief from a different act so like the family's first act with the um, paid time off and things like that that you can't include in this so again that's just going back to double dipping part of the um, exclusions and part of the um, details are just making sure that you're not requesting a loan for the same payroll twice. the two and a half times the allowable pieces or $10 million. So this calculation walks you through total payroll salaries and wages. And I apologize if my audio is still breaking up. It, my um, connection says it's good. Um, it is the average of the total. So what we do in this schedule is gross wages for salaries that are also included in this, which was not in the initial understanding. Um, you can also include health, dental insurance, workers' comp insurance in here, and paid time off. There we go. Um, that includes paid time off. 
stigma taxes compensation. There is talk about the EID loan, which is heard later. If you have costs that you're putting up in here, or for payroll costs that is stations on um, rolling that up. <clears throat> um, reductions in there again, as we talked about, there is a limit to um, the total wages and subcontractors of $100,000. So anything over that we have to reduce. So again, we take our average for the year. So we totaled up all of the gross amounts for May or April, pardon me, of 2019 through March of 2020 and divided that by 12. That gets us to this. The loan is I asked you to type a note to the chamber. If you could send me the phone number, I will absolutely try um, disconnecting my audio from um, here and calling the number in. Yeah, just hang on. Sorry. So hopefully, I will get that and I will call. I apologize for this. So many of these webinars and Susan and every once in a while the bandwidth just drops considerably and I have not figured out why that is actually. Thought I had it figured out. <clears throat> um, we can cover any questions on this specifically that you have. But I am going to continue going. So, peak production program requires use if you want it to be forgiven. So, I'm sure you've heard about tax. Um, but what the Paycheck Protection Program loan funds are intended to be used for is payroll cost, group health care, interest on mortgage incurred prior to the covered period or debt incurred prior to. Now that's not just standard liabilities that you had, it's debt. Um, utilities, including electricity, gas, water, phone, um, one of um, and I do apologize, I'm, I'm still looking for that phone number and I will call in as soon as I get that. Of course, when we test, there is additional information. There is Paycheck Protection Program Michigan.com. The goal of that, it was the MICPA, Small Business Association of Michigan, um, various other organizations trying to get together to make sure that all um, small business Questions for the patient protection loan is the hat. Quite a few questions about seasonal employee employers. So if you're a seasonal employer and you have annual um, or your average compensation, because for a good chunk of the year it is zero probably because you're seasonal. So for a seasonal employer, you use the average monthly payroll, but you're looking at a 12-week period beginning February 15th of 19 for that 12-week period. Period. So that's a slightly different. Um, so loan forgiveness is the next thing that we will talk about. And again, if you have questions, um, you can hear me. Um, I haven't hear, heard another comment, but I am... Um, um, going to continue on and I will still call in as soon as, soon as I get that number. Um, but loan forgiveness, so amounts are uh, the loan forgiveness part of the Paycheck Protection Program is
um, for calculated until probably early July. So when we get to the end of June, early July, that's when you're going to start um, calculating that. So I am 100% certain that the details of the loan forgiveness are going to be clarified. I'm calling in right now, so just give me one second. All right, I am just calling in. All right, the meeting ID is not going through, so I will continue. And if you want to try a different meeting ID, possibly, um, I'll try to continue on. I do apologize for this, and I'm happy to um, do a repeat or make sure that we have um, all of the audio um, at a later date so it can be posted to the Chamber website. Um, but again, so going back to the amounts forgiveness. So what what it is forgiving is based on fund usage in eight weeks. So we've had quite a lot of questions about when the eight week period starts. The eight week period starts from loan origination, um, which is really truly um, should be the same as the loan funding. So once the dollars hit your bank account, that's when the loan or the eight week period starts. So again, when you're calculating forgiveness, you're taking all of the payroll costs um, you're taking all of the payroll costs and um, you're looking at how that those funds are used for an eight week period. We recommended to our clients to, um, to set up a separate bank account for this just to help them identify how they're using the funds to be completely transparent and help with the tracking of some of this. Um, obviously, that's not not a people. Um, and, and again, um, the goal is to the goal is to use the funds to maintain your workforce. I'm going to mute one more second. It looks like I just got a new code in, so I apologize for the delay. One second. All right, so I am hopeful that this is working. I apologize profusely for the delay. Somebody just wants to let me know if you can hear me. Awesome. Okay, so apologies if there are any questions on any of the um, loan, maximum loan calculations on the previous slide, please let me know. Um, I'm, I'm happy to follow up with questions after the call as well, um, especially since we had that audio. Um, issue. So again, I do apologize for that. 
So we are looking at loan forgiveness. So again, the Paycheck Protection Loan is looking at your average monthly payroll compensation and related costs for the 12 months prior, right, times two and a half. So it's looking at 250%. So really two and a half months of these payrolls is what the loan is. The um, CARES Act is saying that a portion of that, or potentially all of that can be forgiven. So this amount forgiven is not going to be taxable at the federal or state level. Um, and there is a calculation to that, right? So we need to make sure that we're looking at what those funds are used for when we're looking at whether all or a portion of it will be forgiven. Um, one of the requirements is that 75% of those loan proceeds must be used for payroll, um, but it can be used for payroll, interest on covered mortgages, rent, and utilities. Um, we are, I did get one question in, so for the 1099 independent contractors, so as I had mentioned earlier, but I'm not sure if you did hear that clearly or not, um, initially, independent contractors were included in the total company calculation. Now, independent contractors, hopefully open tomorrow, are going to be able to, um, hopefully are going to be able to um, submit their own application. So the question is, um, for independent contractors through the Paycheck Protection Program, are about mortgage payments and utilities, what else qualifies? So, believe, but again, we're waiting for full guidance on the loan forgiveness and additional guidance on the independent contractor side of things. Um, we believe that you still need to use 75% for the payroll um, things, uh, and then that you can also use it for interest and covered mortgages, rent, and utilities. Now, again, because independent contractors are a little bit um, different, we'll have to see what that forgiveness calculation really looks like, but we haven't gotten any guidance that it's going to be different from what we, what we have gotten so far for regular companies. So this is a lot of um, numbers, and I do apologize for that. We are looking at a, an estimate of what we think may be forgiven. So we're going back to that initial calculation of the max loan amount that I had a few slides prior. Um, what we're looking at is, again, the forgiveness period starts when the loan is funded or when it hits your bank account when the loan is um, finalized. So we're estimating on this that we're going to spend $200,000 um, for the eight-week period. And then we also can include some of these other um, employee or, or payroll costs like we had talked about earlier. These are pretty much the same categories. State and local taxes are included. Employer or um, FICA and things like that, that is not clear. Um, in this loan forgiveness calculation, obviously, you're still going to do the same thing that you did for the um, loan calculation. You're going to anything over $100,000 for employees that are paid over $100,000. Mortgages, interest, rent, utilities, those are things to see, okay, how much did we actually use of this loan? Because the goal is to use it in an eight-week period. So for this, for this um, example, we have used, before there's some additional reductions, 209,567. So then we're going to look at some additional reductions. So as I said earlier, part of the goal is that you will use this for um, keeping your workforce going. Um, so we're looking at the total payroll cost for the loan calculation. So this total payroll cost is actual. So this is going back to that previous slide. And then and we are waiting on some final clarity on how they're going to calculate the FTEs. I believe it's going to be um, for the same exact way that they calculate that for ACA. And I think that it's going to be pay period, averages of pay periods, not, not monthly. Um, but you look at your average FTE for all of 2020. So you can see in this calculation, it's eight is the average FTEs. And then you can choose if you're going to compare that to um, last year at the same time or earlier this year. You want to show that you haven't reduced too much. So from this example, you can see that you reduced only one from this year to from earlier this year to the average for the whole year. 
um, full-time equivalent is what FTE is. Thank you very much for that question. Um, so that, again, there's a slightly different calculation. It's not just a one full-time in per person that works 40 hours a week. It's 30 hours a week is the calculation, but then there are some additional um, pluses and minuses based on how many hours different individuals work within your organization. We're happy to put a link on um, the Chamber website as well as the Maynard Custerson website for that. And as I said, we are, are thinking it's going to be the same calculation as, um, as has been used for other, other things in the past, but that hasn't been clarified yet. As I said, this forgiveness calculation truly won't be um, finalized until the end of the eight week period. So most organizations that are applying for this loan aren't going to do the calculation until late June, early July to see what is actually forgiven. Um, so as you can see from the previous slide, we used $209,000. We have to reduce it by 28,000 because we had one person less in our FTE calculation and there is a reduction for that. So we're saying we think we're gonna get forgiven $181,000 of our total loan. And obviously it won't go over that. But this is an example of um, how you would go about trying to calculate what you think is gonna be forgiven. Now I will say that just because it's not forgiven doesn't mean it's not a good business um, decision to go get this loan. The portion of the loan that is not forgiven at the end of this eight week period, the interest rate is only 1%. It's payable over two years and you have deferral of pr principal and interest payments for six months. So still, even if you don't get the whole um, piece forgiven, it still is a great um, source of cash flow for those organizations that are um, struggling right now. Um, one of the questions is if an employer reduced their workforce workforce staff before this was available, can they bring people back? Absolutely is the answer to that. We've had a lot of questions from um, business owners that said, hey, you know, this act was passed a week or two weeks after we were forced to send people home. I already laid them off. What do I do now? Bring them back. That's the goal that of this. They really want to make sure that the workforces are coming back to work, that they're staying with their employer, trying to take some of the strain off the unemployment system. Um, so as you're applying for this, and um, I'm guessing many of you have already submitted your applications, obviously there are links through the SBA. Um, if you have a financial institution that you already have a relationship that is an SBA lender, we definitely recommend going to them first. Um, the banks, I will say, and I don't want to speak for any banks um, particular or individually, but just imagine the amount of the volume of transactions and the volume of requests they're getting right now. I, it, it is a, a lot, right? So be patient with the system, be patient with the SBA, be patient with the lenders. They're trying to get through things. Um, it's an astronomical increase in the amount of funds that they're trying to disperse in a couple of weeks, even compared to what they did like all of last year um, through the SBA program. So some of the things in all of the banks are different. Definitely go, most of the ones that are doing this lending have um, some sort of a portal. So they're setting up the application process. You can go right through them and you don't even have to start with the SBA site. But on the SBA site, as well as um, Paycheck Protection Program, Michigan.com, there is a copy of what the application looks like. Um, they're usually going to ask you for supporting payroll documentation for average monthly payroll. This would include, especially for independent contractors, 1099s that you've um, received, looking at payroll tax filings, payroll journals. Um, many of them are looking at year-end financial statements for last year. Um, there has been a lot of question on um, whether or not the average um, payroll calculation is using a calendar year or um, from the date that the, the loan was requested, so April through March, April of 19 through March of 2020, everything that we're um, pre preparing and providing for people is April through March of this year. Um, it is obviously easier if you just take year-end um, payroll calculations because that's all ready for you. But I will say if you're using um, a payroll provider, most of them, many of them that we work with um, are pre preparing these packages and you can just click the Paycheck Protection Program package, put in the date range and it gives you the information that you need. Um, make sure that you know what your NAICS code is. There has been some discussion on whether or not um, uh, and whether or not 
um, there has been some discussion on whether or not the small business um, definition for the SBA applies to this. And there is some wiggle room to have for employers that are over 500, depending on the industry. I think I mentioned this earlier. So just make sure you put that in there that helps the lenders be able to um, work with you. You are going to have to give all ownership information for any owners over 20%. And there are quite a few questions if you have owners that have other business interests. They are asking for lists of all of those. One of the questions that we had gotten was, um, will it disqualify me if one of my owners is um, not in the US, if it's a foreign or owner, will that disqualify me? The answer to that is not necessarily. You do, or if that, that um, partial owner has a lot of different business interests, will that disqualify you? Again, not necessarily, but do make sure that you disclose all of that information because you would hate for, um, that not to be disclosed, it found out later, and then it holds up your whole process. Um, and then you do have to put in a detailed listing of anticipated fund use. Again, a lot of this information, especially the top part of this slide, the payroll and things like that is available. If you just click um, in your payroll program, they've got these canned reports going. So thank you. I know somebody put in um, a link to um, lenders. There is also a similar link, um, and again, the Paycheck Protection Program Michigan website is our state specific, so it's really trying to promote Michigan businesses getting these this money. Um, so I would encourage you to do that as well, but that's uh, the SBA is definitely a great site as well. Um, the other thing to um, think about, and then um, we certainly can go over any other questions that you might have, but is the emergency grants. So um, within the SBA, or within the CARES Act, rather, there was $10 billion in funding for emergency EIDL grants. Now, this program was through the SBA before, but now it's expanded because of COVID-19 in particular. So the what we heard in the beginning and what was publicized, I think, is that it was $10,000 and you get it within three days. We've tweaked that, as you can see in these um, bottom two bullet points, emergency grant advance of up to $10,000, advance funds intended to be provided within three days. Um, as you can imagine, as I said, with the Paycheck Protection Program funds, um, there is a lot of um, there's a huge volume, right? So we have to be patient, number one, which is difficult to do, but we do have to be patient because we're learning that the funds aren't coming within three days. I know that the SBA um, was updating some of their forms and I did read a Q and A, um, I think it was on a frequently asked questions on the SBA website. If you submitted it and you were just completely on the ball and then they changed the application, there may be a reason for you to resubmit that. Um, so definitely make sure that you're keeping an eye out for that. Um, you can get the, this emergency grant and, and participate in the Paycheck Protection Program. You, you just need to make sure, um, and this goes along with some of the other programs in the CARES Act, the um, employer pay, payroll, um, pay tax, or employer tax deferral, um, as well as the employee retention credit. All of it, it just is kind of woven throughout the CARES Act that you need to make sure that you're not using, and the Families First, actually, you're not using the same funding and getting all of the money for everything. It's, it's relatively logical. Um, so how would you know, one of the questions for this EIDL grant is how would I know if I need to reapply for this program? And that is a great question. I actually have, I'm on a call um, with some individuals from the SBA this afternoon um, and hope to get some clarity because we've had quite a lot of um, clients that said it's been a week, a week and a half and they haven't heard anything and they don't know necessarily where to reach out. So I hope to have um, some more clarity. I'll certainly pass that along um, as well as to the chamber as soon as we know the answer to that. So um, that's not a great answer, but that's what I've got right now. Are there any questions on EIDL or the Paycheck Protection Program funding? I know I went through the initial slides, slides a little bit quicker than I had intended um, because of my audio issues. Steve, do you have any questions? I know some of the questions that I have gotten um, 
from my clients in the past, and I'll just go through some of those because we've really been trying to reach out to um, people. So we've had a lot of people as, as they're going through this um, loan application, they're wondering where, how to calculate that payroll cost. And again, it does include commissions, it does include bonuses, it does include um, um, guaranteed payments, it does include cash payments for health insurance premiums and retirement contributions, things like that. So that's something to keep in mind. We've also gotten um, a lot of questions recently actually related to um, how the this app applies to nonprofit organizations. And as I said, 501c6 trade organizations don't apply for the Paycheck Protection Program, but they do they do or can benefit from the other programs within the CARES Act. We also um, know that obviously charitable organizations can apply for the Ch Paycheck Protection Program. I'm, I'm just going to go backwards a little bit um, hey, since Sarah? we have the audio. Hey, yep. Yeah? We do. We do have a um, yes, Roger that's going to uh, ask a question, uh, Colin. So. Allow okay. him to talk. Perfect. Go ahead, Roger. Awesome. Can you hear me now? Yes, we can. Okay. Um, I have a nonprofit 501c3, but we do not have any payroll. All of our members are volunteers, but we still have the need for some funding to offset the rent, the utilities, and such. Would I be um, qualified for anything? You would. The EIDL loan is something you certainly should look at. Um, and that was on that last slide, the link that you can go directly to the SBA website and there is an application for that. Um, obviously, the Paycheck Protection Program wouldn't be something um, unless you are, um, well, yeah, that, that wouldn't be something that you would apply for. If you are paying any independent contractors to help out, the independent contractors might be able to apply. Um, if you have, you know, fundraising consultants or something like that that are coming in that you might have paid a or issued a 1099 to as opposed to an employee, but the EIDL grant would be um, a good a good avenue. Great. I thank you so much. Yeah, any other questions, please let, us, please let us know. We're happy to help. And with the EIDL grant, really, you're just saying that you have had a dramatic reduction in your um, gross receipts. So you've been impacted by this disaster, by COVID-19. And the goal is to get that money out um, quicker, obviously. The program that I mentioned that's in the CARES Act is an expedited method. That program was actually with the SBA even before. Um, it's just expedited to try to get that money out. We did have another, um, Steve, as you're looking to see if there's any other questions, we had another question within the chat. If you have a diverse company that could qualify for all of the programs, does it make sense to apply for all of them or focus on one program? Um, is there an advantage to going after one program? So one thing I will say is all of the programs had um, initially had some goals as to timing, right? So we thought the EIDL grants would be funded in a very short period of time. We thought the Paycheck Protection Program would be funded very, very quickly. And it, it, the volume of, we thought in the unemployment system would be up and running to be able to handle all the claims, right? So um, the advice I would say is no, there isn't a huge advantage to going after one and not multiple. If you can go after multiple, do it. Just make sure you're not using the same um, record. So for example, if you have people that are on unemployment and you're not going to pay them back or hire them back, um, that's not something that will be forgiven in the Paycheck Protection Program loan, right? If you have people that are off and because of the Family First Act, because they were directly impacted um, by COVID-19, because they were directly caring for somebody or they had, had child care things, you can't use their compensation or that PTO because that's already been forgiven through or addressed through the Family Search Act, you can't double dip and use that again. So that's the one thing to be careful of. Um, 
if you just transition your company from 1099 contractors for staff to W-2 employees, is there any recourse to qualify for paycheck protection now? So that is there. There is an element um, of some some subcontractors. So they have said if you misclassified people that you were paying and they should have been employees, but they were issued 1099s, then they are saying you can put those on your Paycheck Protection Program loan application. Now, I, I would um, just caution you that that is saying that you misclassified individuals and you were paying them as independent contractors when they should have been employees, right? So um, we'll, we'll see what that information is used for. Certainly, you need to make sure that you're classifying them appropriately according to IRS guidelines. Um, so you could be liable for the difference in the past depending on if that's audited or how that's handled. Um, one another question what can the edl loan be used to pay for so that is not as restrictive as the um as the paycheck protection program again you can use it for payroll but that's not a requirement it's more a grant funding um and they have extended this so it's a loan program but a piece of that can be forgiven as well um, any other questions? I don't see any through the chat right now. I do have some questions that I had been sent um, again beforehand. I'm happy to go through. Um, so we have had um, a question on recommendations, and this is kind of related to the CARES Act, but so the everything's delayed. We're not supposed to have anybody besides essential workers in the businesses. How do you how do you still keep your business going? How do you deposit your checks if everybody's working remotely? How do you pay your bills? Things like that. Um, so there is guidance within the essential services that you can have essential business functions, which means you can have somebody go in, collect the mail on a weekly basis, make your deposits, you can still pay your bills. If the only way that you have to do that is to go physically in the office in the office to do it, um, obviously you wouldn't wanna send 10 people in all at the same time. We've seen a lot of organizations that have just a schedule if they need to have a person manning the front desk or something like that um, because they have clients coming in to make payments. Um, they just are aware of the um, restrictions from the governor and they are making sure that they have a schedule that rotates so somebody comes in each day to make sure that payments are processed or something like that. Um, so those are some of the concerns. Steve, I don't want to keep talking if there's other um, questions that you wanted to put in, but. No, I think the, um, no, again, and thank you, everybody, and sorry for some of the technical difficulties at the beginning there. And again, we'll make sure that we'll, uh, um, Sarah and I will kind of go through this and um, uh, make sure that it's, uh, you can hear everything as she's going through uh, when we put that out later. Um, but I guess the question, um, Sarah, for you is, and I know, again, everything is going and moving so quickly. Um, and, are you guys hearing any more? I know today, I think the, the United States Senate is is looking at um, kind of this whole phase four, but also adding additional dollars to the PPP uh, program and how that's gonna impact what's currently going on. I know, again, I don't know if you'll have the answer or not, but um, just something for everybody on this call. And I know we're, we're kind of following as well on what that's gonna look like. Yeah, absolutely. I actually was on a call before this and I did hear that um, something for larger companies up to 10,000 employees is being looked at and passed. I think we knew that a round four was going to come. Um, we're still waiting to see what the time frame for some of that funding is, if it extends some of, like we're talking about the forgiveness of the debt for the PPP loan um, is an eight week period. That's assuming all of this is kind of settled by June 30th. And I think we're all learning that nothing is happening as quickly as we think. COVID-19 isn't leaving, you know, or isn't, is the, um, the worst of it 
sometimes is further out than we thought it was going to be, even though we all are practicing social isolation and all of those things. So I think there's a lot to um, that we'll see in the coming week probably on if they're going to extend when you have to use the funds. I absolutely think there's going to be an influx in the stimulus because the need, um, we knew when they passed the first round or the CARES Act, we knew that it wasn't enough for small businesses across the country. Um, I think I was talking to someone and they thought on average that would give every small business that's registered in the U.S. like $20,000. Well, that's not, I mean, most of the loans are going to be more than, the loan requests are more than $20,000. So we knew the funding wasn't going to be enough. Um, so that is definitely, I think that today there is some conversations about that as well. Um, I, I guess I do have a couple more questions that I had received in, not through the chat, but just through email. If you don't mind me covering those, I just want to make sure people um, are thinking about things. Feel free to ask questions. I will leave my contact information up there as well. Um, we have had, and I think I mentioned earlier, but we had some audio issues when I was saying it. So the payroll companies are also trying to modify reports as things are um, clarified within the guidance. So you may have had um, changes in some of the reports, even if you pulled the Paycheck Protection Program or the CARES Act package from your payroll company, there may be changes from when you did that if you did it a week ago. So just make sure before you submit your application, you've got the most up-to-date one. We did, get, um, we did get some questions, should I reapply or continue to reapply? If you've had communication with your lender, I would say it's okay to, you know, reach out to them and say there's some modifications in whatever report or supporting documentation you have had, but I would not recommend continuing to resubmit if it's an electronic process. I think that just is going to really clog the system even more. Um, we had um, another question, if this extends past when your business is viable anymore, um, in other words, you use the funds as listed for the purposes listed, but you go out of business anyway at a later date, are there ramifications to the business owner? Um, so that's not clear. Now I would say the, the forgiveness calculation will be done, done at the end of this eight week period. So if you tried to use the funds and you're out of business by, you know, before the eight week period is over, I would say um, there might be some additional um, conversations, but really that financial viability, um, this is intended to make sure that you can get past that point. So as long as your the guidance, and this is me saying this, this is not an SBA converse, or an SBA directive or anything like that or anything coming down the pike, but I think that you would you would be covered if you are using it for appropriate purposes and if you are trying to move things forward. That's what the stimulus money was intended to do. And I think that um, the government is really going to look at that time period because I and and that's why kind of the phase four funding is coming through because they're realizing it's not enough for all small businesses. Um, but unfortunately, um, this is going to have a huge impact on a lot of businesses out there. So I, I'm just to be, you know, transparent and real, that definitely is a real concern for people. Um, we talked about um, the 75%. That's the other thing. Make sure you are using it for payroll if you want to get that forgiven. Um, but again, and I think my audio was fine when I said this, but I do want to reiterate that even if you can't use it all for payroll because you can't hire people back in time or whatever the reason is, um, it's still not a bad business decision to get this loan at 1% interest for two years um, with six months deferral on payments. I mean, that still from a business perspective is a real good a real good plan. The other question before we um, log off, and I know um, I, I was having trouble with audio and now you can't get me to be quiet, but um, the other question that I've had is what about hazard pay? So if we're bringing these people back, there are a lot of concerns that people don't want to come back to work. They're scared. They don't know what to do. Can, can you give them kind of a bump up for hazard pay or a bonus during this difficult time? And the answer to that is yes. Obviously, you know, that's a business decision with the changes in unemployment, the increases to un unemployment, the expansion of um, how long you can be on unemployment. There's a lot of decisions that families are making, business owners are making, what, what makes the most sense. Um, but the goal with this is to bring them back 
you absolutely want to help the families. Um, if it's a business decision and it makes sense for you to do hazard pay or a bonus or something like that, that is absolutely allowable. They're just looking at what you're using the, the money for. And then the last thing I'll say, um, and let's see if you have any more questions, is we do have um, some Q&A sessions that we certainly invite all of um, the chamber members. If there's any other resources that we can provide to the chamber, we're certainly happy to help out and do that. Um, and then we do have on Monday a, a session specifically targeted toward nonprofits because there is so much um, clarity yet to, to be um, received on how some of those nonprofits can get some of this funding. Well, thank you so much, Sarah. And I just want to, again, thank you, everybody, uh, for joining us uh, on this webinar this morning. Um, we have a few, uh, just like everybody else, uh, um, you know, we'll have an email out, kind of a plan your week, and, and providing, um, um, including Maynard's uh, uh, webinar schedule for next week, but uh, several others, including uh, other chamber uh, uh, webinars that will be focused on um, healthcare insurance uh, for your employees, cybersecurity, and a few others uh, for next week. But I just want to, again, thank you, Sarah, so much. We'll get this out to everybody, and I hope everybody has a great day, and please do not hesitate to contact us. Uh, please go to our Chamber resource page for any additional uh, information that you need. Thank you. Thank you.